everyone to our Facebook Live, kicking off the week with the lovely and talented Dr. Lisa Corris, who's here to talk to us about breast health and cosmetic and plastic surgery and reconstructive surgery and all the things that she does every day. Well, she will be doing every day again. So let's start with welcoming. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me at the Creative Hive. It's very exciting. I've been looking forward to this. So yeah, no, it's nice to be able to sit and chat with you guys. So the Creative Hive, I mean, everyone is working remotely right now. We're going to slowly start seeing things as opened up again, but I want to focus in a little bit on your background before we kind of get into talking about COVID and the effects and how it's obviously affected your, your practice right now. But tell us a little bit about you, you know, what drew you to, you know, becoming a doctor and plastic and reconstructive surgery and specifically? Um, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a plastic surgeon. It's um, one of those things. I think the more and more I learned about the specialty, the more and more interested I was because it's not only life and death, but there's a lot of quality of life issues that plastic surgery can address. And so that's really how my practice has evolved as well. So I do focus on breast surgery and a large portion of that is breast reconstruction after breast cancer treatment. So women who have lost their breasts because of cancer. Um, so that's been a really rewarding part of my practice. And then I also have kind of the lighter, funner side in terms of doing cosmetic surgery on breasts. And, um, you know, people have great satisfaction from these surgeries if they think it's right for them. Um, so it's just, it's, it's a nice specialty to be in because you get to put smile on people's faces and, you know, and really improve their quality of life overall. Again? Okay, there we go. <laughs> Perfect. Um, that looks much better. It's not frozen anymore. Yeah, you know, I think it's my Wi-Fi. Um, some days it works and some days it decides it wants to be a pain in the butt. We'll talk about butts later. <laughs> it's on the list. It's on the it's list. On list. It's on the list. You know, I was just asking you, being able to impact how people feel directly and, you know, in a positive way, is that kind of what drew you to this as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's one of those things that, in terms of when you deal with people, it's nice because, um, you know, especially after cancer, they've, they've gone through the life and death. They've kind of had time to, to face that fear. And then it's sort of recollecting the pieces after and, you know, redefining what their, their body is going to look like going forward. Um, and so you get to go through that journey with people. And it's a very emotional journey, definitely, to be involved in, in that process. But it's absolutely very rewarding at the end. What brought you back to Edmonton? You know, you could practice anywhere in the world, but you chose our today rainy city. You know, it's, well, yeah, it's, it's rainy, but it's going to feel very fresh outside after that, for sure. Um, you know, born and raised in Edmonton, and it's funny because growing up, all I thought about was leaving, right? I was going to, you know, be a Park Avenue plastic surgeon, live in New York City. And then um, in the process of my training, I actually got to spend time in a lot of different programs across Canada. So, you know, spent time in Vancouver, spent time in Toronto and Winnipeg and London and you really start to appreciate how good we have it here you know especially with the organization of our healthcare system the plastic surgery group here is great quality of life is pretty good you know especially in terms of our restaurant scene um, you know and we're trying to support as many people as we can right now with, with takeout but yeah you kind of I mean I think you take it for granted when you grow up in it but after having traveled around the country um, and a little bit throughout the United States as well and seeing some of their programs um, you realize we actually have it pretty good here so I was pretty blessed to be able to to come back here and work. You know it says a lot for the city and the community too I think you don't sometimes realize how interconnected and how supportive this community is and as you face something like COVID because you also your doors are closed ish right now but as as of last Thursday they were. Yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, about six weeks ago when the, the whole world shut down, um, yeah, it was pretty interesting because we had heard rumblings that the ORs were going to be closed and I maybe naively assumed, you know, that they would release a plan and scale back things slowly, but it was literally Tuesday, middle of the day, we found out that our day was canceled on Wednesday. So it was unfortunate we had to give patients less than 24 hour notice that surgeries were being canceled. And you know, similarly to a holiday, people plan their lives around having surgery just to make sure they've got time off work to recover. They have supports in place, you know, to help them out when they're not able to walk around as much. So, yeah, we um, we are essentially shut down. Um, you know, the announcements at the end of last week are great. I think the doors are slowly, very slowly opening again. Um, and we'll see. So in two weeks, you know, either things will just continue to progress with opening or 
in two weeks, we might see the numbers go up and then have to scale things back down again. Nobody really knows at this point. Um, and I will say we've had a few calls to the office this morning. Cosmetic surgery is not going ahead right now. So the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta has made it pretty clear that cosmetic surgery is not to resume. Um, so basically, we're resuming hospital surgeries, but they also have to be day surgeries. So in terms of some of the complex breast reconstruction that we do, where we take tissue from the belly and move it up to the breast, we're not allowed to do that right now just because the, the hospital stay is too long. So it's very light day surgeries and very limited numbers that are that are opening up again right now. Well, we'll all uh, keep our fingers crossed so that progression continues and that everyone is safe while doing so. I know precautions are being taken. Let's get into your PowerPoint because I know you you prepared a really nice PowerPoint for us and we're going to have walk through that. It's going to really take us through all those different stages of breast health. It's going to talk about what you do best and some of those questions that people have already asked you that you're, we're going to we're going to jump into some yeah, of those. Absolutely. Yeah, that sounds good. So let's get the share screen going again. And do you see it? Is it? I do see it. Well done. Perfect. So yeah, I just put together a whole bunch of different topics relating to, um, to breasts. So hopefully um, people that are tuning in will find something relevant to them. Um, but in terms of one of my passions, it's definitely dealing with women who've undergone treatment for breast cancer. And so why should people care? What's the big deal with breast cancer? You know, there's so many people out there talking about their causes. Well, breast cancer is probably the most can common cancer in women in Canada. And so the latest statistics say one in eight people will get diagnosed with breast cancer. So if it's not you yourself, you will probably know somebody that's been affected by it. And our numbers are going up in terms of breast cancer. And that's, you know, for many reasons, probably just because we've got an aging population and more people around, but you're going to know somebody that's been affected by breast cancer. Um, has testing changed that as well, the number of cases? Yeah, well, so exactly. So with doing more regular screening, we're catching cancers earlier. And that's part of the reason we're actually seeing um, survival increase or mortality go down because we're catching the cancers earlier. And when you catch them earlier, they're easier to treat. Um, yeah, so that's a huge part, part of that. And I've got a few slides coming up because interestingly, they shut down screening over the last six weeks here in Alberta as well. So that's kind of going to complicate um, in terms of breast cancer diagnosis. Um, this is very interesting though, your risk, your risk factors. I mean, I think people sometimes forget that there's more to it than just your family history. Absolutely. So probably your own genetic makeup and family history are the most important um, in terms of risk. Age is one of the most commonly known risk factors is as you age, you're going to increase your chance of getting breast cancer. Um, but there's also outside factors that can influence your chances. And I thought I would touch a little bit more upon those today, because I think as everyone's spending a lot more time at home, you know, maybe eating a little bit too much, drinking a little bit too much or having, oh, time, come on. <laughs> having time to reflect upon their health. Um, it's important to know how these things can actually impact your risk of breast cancer. Um, yeah, so definitely outside of genetics and family history, things that we worry about is your exposure to estrogen. Um, and there's things that you probably can't change in terms of how much estrogen exposure you get in your lifetime. So people that go through puberty sooner, people who don't have children or don't breastfeed as long or later menopause can impact um, your lifetime estrogen exposure. Medications can affect things as well. Um, so birth control pill, hormone replacement therapy. Um, but actually lifestyle factors can affect the amount of estrogen that your body is exposed to. Um, and so one of the probably most well-known factors um, that I'll talk about is obesity. And so in terms of just a scientific approach to obesity, it's if your BMI or body mass index is over 30. And you can calculate that just in terms of looking at your weight and height. Um, you can do it metric. There's online calculators if you know your measurements in the imperial system. But we do know that women tend to gain weight as they age. And especially after menopause, one of the main sources of estrogen in the body is from the fatty tissues. So um, obesity, we know, is not good for you for a variety of reasons. In plastic surgery, we really worry about it because it can um, it increases your risk of complications after surgery. Your wounds might not heal as well. It's not good for your heart, but interestingly, it's also not good for your breasts. Um, and so that's, I think, something you know, 
people that are, are looking to optimize their weight, maybe that's extra incentive to know, especially, um, you know, if you have other risk factors, you know, that might increase your risk of breast cancer, this might be something that you might be able to, to address. What risk factors do, do some weigh more heavily than others, or is it just kind of, you don't always know which ones are going to affect each person? Um, so in terms of, yeah, so getting back to risk factors, the, the strongest ones are going to be the family history and the genetics. In terms of all these lifestyle factors um, that I'm talking about, so these we know through more population studies. So it's hard to know how obesity is going to affect one person specifically. Mm -hmm. um, but we do know on a population level that um, if you see higher rates of obesity, you're going to see higher rates of breast cancer. Um, and so I think going hand in hand, we can't guarantee that if you get to an optimal weight, optimize your diet and cut out alcohol, you're not going to get breast cancer because there's other things involved, but you can hopefully at least reduce your risk. And they're the things you personally have control over because a lot of it you don't. Exactly. So the reason I like to talk about them is uh, essentially, you know, they are things that you can control. And I mean, I think it's something that our population struggles with in general um, is obesity, but it's just, it's extra information maybe to help empower people if they're, if they're working on getting healthy. Um, throw in a quick thing about um, alcohol, because I think everybody is enjoying a few quarantinis here and there as well. Um, <laughs> quarantinis, I like it. And, uh, you know, there, there's definitely been articles that have come out about the health benefits of alcohol, specifically related to red wine, um, but there's also a lot of negative effects as well. So most notably, we know that alcohol is bad for the liver, it's bad for the waistline because it's a lot of empty calories. But interestingly, they have found that alcohol consumption is linked to higher serum levels of estrogen too. So not only is it bad for, for your liver and maybe your overall weight, but it can also affect your breasts and your chances of breast cancer. So That's a little sad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I think it's everything in moderation. So, um, you know, and this is not for me to come on my high horse. I think everybody's, you know, dealing with the situation right now with COVID as best they can. And a lot of people get stress relief from drinking, but you know, I think it, the, the take home message is, is everything in moderation. So, you know, if you cut back, then you're going to decrease those serum estrogen levels and, you know, decrease your risk of breast cancer. Um, and then diets. So there's been a lot of research that has come out about Western diets influencing your risk of breast cancer. Um, and again, too, so these are population studies. We don't know, you know, on a one-to-one -one exactly what is causing these things, but there's been a few theories in terms of highly fatty foods, increasing serum estrogen levels, and also actually mass produced meat and dairy, because a lot of these producers will rely on the addition of hormones to the animals just to be able to increase their yields of meat and dairy. So um, we've seen people that have moved from Eastern countries where they had healthier diets. And then within a few generations, when they've adopted these Western lifestyles, their breast cancer risk goes up. And so, um, yeah, it's just something to think about. I, you know, like I said, at the end of the day, if you improve all these things, are we going to say your risk of breast cancer is going to be zero? Absolutely not. But, you know, it's going to be, you know, healthier for you in general for a variety of reasons. Yeah, you know, learning these things or, you know, being reminded of these things, I think so many of us know them already. It's being reminded of them that just puts it forefront, right? As you're yeah. talking about different topics. Exactly. So, yeah, so I wanted to just throw in some kind of health things as they relate to breast, because again, we probably all had a little bit more time to reflect on our lifestyle over the last few weeks. So, it yeah. just hopefully that empowers people in terms of making better decisions for their health. Um, but yeah, I thought I'd talk a little bit about screening as well. So, you know, you, you kind of already mentioned um, where we talked about screening allows us to catch cancer earlier. And if you catch your cancer earlier, you're less likely to die from it, which is a really good thing. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, just because of the whole shutdown over the last few weeks, they did actually stop doing breast cancer screening. And um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Athena Bennett, she's a general surgeon out of the Sturgeon Hospital. Um, so I was chatting with her about all these things this week, um, just to make sure I wasn't also giving false information, but she was saying most of the cancers they treat, probably about 70 to 80% of the cancers that are treated here in Alberta are caught on mammograms. 
So these are women that don't have symptoms. They don't have a lump that they felt. So it's these screening, the screening that's really important in terms of catching these cancers so they can be treated early. Um, as of last week with things opening up again, I'm hopeful that that will change this week. I, you know, I haven't had any confirmation that screening has opened up again, but hopefully it will start. Um, but I just thought I'd review screening guidelines in Canada as well, just because the, re the recommendations are a little bit interesting when you dwell further into the numbers. Um, and a lot of it comes down to, you know, go talk to your family doctor to discuss what's right for you. But essentially- now, should, screening, should screening have been maybe labeled an essential service? I mean, we can't go back on that now. So the hope is just to push forward and that it opens up soon. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I would, I would think so. I mean, at the end of the day, if you close screening down for six weeks, you know, it's probably not the end of the world. I don't know, you know, because most people probably when they're scheduled for their mammogram might be off by a month or two anyways, you know, when they're going for the regular screening. Um, so hopefully the six weeks isn't going to make a big difference, but definitely going forward, um, you know, if we have to go back into lockdown, hopefully that would be a consideration just to be able to continue to do that safely. Um, yeah. And so in terms of screening, so interestingly in Canada, they do not recommend mammograms for people between 40 and 49 years old. But when you go deeper into the numbers, they found that there actually is a survival benefit for this group. So um, there's actually a benefit if they do go for mammograms in terms of preventing deaths from breast cancer. Um, Probably the main reason they haven't recommended mass screening of this group is you do have a higher chance of what we call false, um, um, false positives. And so basically, you'll have something light up on the mammogram, um, and it's not cancer, but you need further workup and further tests to prove that it's not. And so the recommendation said, well, instead of causing women to worry about all these false positives, um, let's just not screen them because, you know, the advantages aren't as big as we see in other groups. Um, but I'll go through, I'll, I'll kind of summarize the numbers in the end. But basically, in this age group, you'd have to screen 1,724 women to prevent one death. Um, wow. So, and in other countries, I think the U.S. does start screening in this group. So if it's something that you're worried about, and these screening guidelines apply to people without other like genetic or family history. So this is just general population. But if you're worried about breast cancer, then talk to your family doctor and you might decide with your family doctor that it's actually appropriate for you to start screening um, once you're 40. And so the, the most common in Canada we'll see is between 50 to 69. Most people will undergo screening every two to three years and it is recommended. Um, there's still the chance of um, false, I think I put false negatives, but I mean false positives. Um, so basically there is the chance of, um, you know, having something light up that's not breast cancer and undergoing unnecessary testing. But in terms of this age group, it's not actually a huge difference between the 40 to 49 um, and the 50 to 69. So you'd have to do 1,333 tests to prevent one death. So it's still between the one and 2,000 mark versus when you look at people in their 70s, um, just because breast cancer is more common in this age group, you only need to screen 645 people to prevent one death. Um, wow, that number, drop, that number changes dramatically. Yeah, exactly. So I, I just on a personal level have always found these numbers interesting. Um, so in that we don't recommend screening for this younger age group, even though there is survival benefits. So I tell people just empower yourself with the information and go talk to your family doctor, you know, and they can kind of help you help guide you through what the, the evidence is and the literature says to make the decision right for you. Um, and just thought I'd throw it out there. They no longer recommend self breast exam and clinical breast exam. And these recommendations, I just say conditional. So at the end of the day too, they just say, talk to your doctor about it, but it's not currently recommended. There's so much changing information. I mean, I think we find that on so many fronts. So how do we as women guide through this? And is this just for women or is this for men as well? So these, these guidelines are for women. Um, breast cancer does happen in men, but it tends to be a lot more rare. Um, I think it's just keep in touch with your family doctor because they're going to be the ones that are going to have to be up to date on what the most current guidelines are because they change every few years. Technology changes, you know, with the sensitivity of mammograms. So, you know, their quality is improving over time and then new studies come out. So um, I think the best thing is just keep in talk keep in touch with your family doctor because it's their job to stay, you know, on top of what the latest evidence is for all these things. 
So um, I just thought I'd throw out there. So I don't know how much you wanted to talk about breast reconstruction, which is actually how we first met um, with the Bre Breast Reconstruction Awareness Day. We had you um, host that the last time that I ran it. Um, but once people have been diagnosed with breast cancer and treated for it, then that's when they come see me in terms of reconstructing a breast from scratch. Um, some questions that I had come in over the weekend. One I'm still so surprised to get, but is breast reconstruction covered by Alberta Healthcare? And absolutely it is. Um, I did a study a few years ago, just trying to look at all the numbers in Alberta of who had been reconstructed. And we were still getting about just 20% of women who have lost their breast because of breast cancer treatment were getting reconstruction. Um, it's not to say maybe some of these women maybe just weren't healthy enough or chose not to get reconstruction because it's not important to them and that's absolutely fine. But you know, we definitely still wanna get the message out that if it's something you're interested in that you know it's an option for you and it's absolutely covered. And important to note there that it's covered for breast reconstruction. Yes. Not covered cosmetically. So anybody no. who didn't hear that, it is not covered cosmetically. Reconstructive exactly. surgery. And that is huge to get out there. I mean, I, breast cancer has impacted my family directly several times and in several different ways. And to know that that option is out there and that's not something you're going to have to put out after, you know, the years sometimes of struggling and battling against that, that, that is a huge message to continue to get out there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's maybe, you know, I'm so involved with it that I kind of, I'm just like, how does everybody not know what all their options are? But it is surprising to, to still get these questions. And, you know, occasionally I'll have people, you know, sent into my office that had a mastectomy 15 years ago and have just found out about breast reconstruction. So yeah, it's definitely absolutely covered by Alberta Healthcare. Um, one of the other questions I got is, so once you're diagnosed with breast cancer, when do you meet with a plastic surgeon? And we don't really come in until later. So the most important thing is obviously that your cancer is treated. Um, if you're pretty healthy and you have a very early cancer, you might be a candidate for what we call a media breast reconstruction. So where we can start making your breast right after the mastectomy and the same surgery. And if that's the case, then your general surgeon after you've met with them will refer you to a plastic surgeon. Um, but then there's also the situation where you know, for example, yeah, women that had their mastectomies, you know, 10, 15 years ago, maybe just weren't given the option, or if your cancer is more advanced. So if they're thinking you're going to need radiation right now, or you're maybe not in the best of health, they'll probably say the decision is let's just treat your cancer now, let you heal from these things. And then it's up to your family doctor to refer you to a plastic surgeon in the future. If it has only affected one breast, um, do you match to the other one or would yeah, it apply yeah. to both? Yeah, so the other breast, um, it's been a little bit of a controversial topic on, uh, well, I guess two fronts. So I'll talk about um, contralateral prophylactic mastectomy. So one of the most common things to see, and I have patients ask me about this as well, is, well, I've had cancer on the one side. Should I not get the other breast off? Um, and outside of genetic component to the breast cancer, if it's just a spontaneous breast cancer that's come up, there's really no indication to take off the other breast because you're probably more likely to develop cancer again in the same side than you are to get a new cancer in the other side. So if, you know, outside of genetic reasons for breast cancer, such as kind of, you know, we call it the BRCA one and two, like Angelina Jolie had, then there's no reason to take off the other breast. Um, if we do have the other breast, then we have to try our best to match to it. And, um, I like to tell people we're plastic surgeons, not magic surgeons. So we won't make the exactly same breast that you had, and it's not going to be exactly the same as the other side. So sometimes we have to do a lift on the other side or a little reduction on the other side, um, or potentially um, sometimes we even put in an implant if the, the breast is quite small. Um, yeah, so definitely we do have to consider the other side when it comes down to it. And... There we go. Okay, you're back. I don't know where you, where you, where you um, heard me finish off there. So the last part that I heard was um, that you guys are plastic surgeons. You're not. Magic surgeons. Yeah, yeah. So, 
Yeah, so it's tricky. When we are reconstructing a breast, it's not going to be the same breast that you had before. It's not going to be the exactly same as the other side. So unless, um, or if we can't think we're going to get it close, then what that means is sometimes that other breast, we will do a little lift or a reduction or even put in an implant just to get better symmetry. And is that part covered then if it's using the other breast? It is. Yeah, okay. exactly. Just because, I, you know, it acknowledges the fact that there's limitations to our surgical technique. Um, so to get you the best result possible, a balancing procedure on the other side is covered. Interesting. Okay. We have one question that's come up here. Um, okay. Does drinking soy milk increase your risk for breast cancer and is soy bad for your breasts? Yeah, so there is, yeah, and that's, again, it's one of those things we don't really have a clear answer for. Um, there has been some literature to suggest that soy is higher in estrogens. And so if that truly is the case that drinking soy is increasing your serum estrogen levels, then yes, there might be a correlation. Um, that being said, there's a study that came out, um, it was a few months ago, and it was kind of throughout the news that showed that just drinking milk can potentially increase your risk of breast cancer. Um, yeah, so I mean, there's so many things um, involved in the process. I don't think almond milk increases estrogen, but definitely that theory about soy has been around. We don't know for sure if that link exists, but it is something um, that has been talked about. Okay. Well, you know, yeah. The, like everything, you have to just keep on it and keep up to date with it. I mean, there's so many things that are changing as we change how we test for things. So, yeah, absolutely. It's just, yeah, everything's evolving and it's kind of, I'll talk about levels of evidence a little bit later, but we're seeing it with COVID now too, right? You know, preliminary studies are coming out and then as we're having the time to do better studies, longer studies, um, the evidence is changing because it's becoming more refined. So it's just, you got to stay on top of things. It's, you know, the world is continuously changing. And so is the evidence that we have for everything. So how do you go about making breasts? I think that's your next slide too. I, I yeah. think that's an interesting topic. And, you know, if people are watching, please keep sending your questions. We are going to get those, get to those as well. Yeah. So um, basically the way that you can break it down, I think the easiest is either with breast implants or using your own tissues. So it kind of comes down to two options. Um, when we use breast implants, often we'll put in a temporary spacer called a tissue expander, and we fill that up with fluid to stretch out the skin. And once we've got enough skin, then we take you back for a second surgery, take out the tissue expander and can put in a breast implant. Um, the nice thing with this surgery is it generally doesn't have another donor site, meaning we don't have to disrupt another part of your body. Um, so this is a good surgery for kind of, you know, fit people that don't want to have functional limitations and just, you know, want to get back to, to life as quick as possible. Um, but the implants aren't like, aren't lifelong devices. So they need to know that um, they might have to, you know, do further surgeries down the road to deal with the implants. Um, and that's opposed to using your own tissues. And so hopefully you can kind of see that on the screen there, but when we use your own tissues, the most common um, way to make a breast is to actually take the belly tissue. So we talk about that spare tire that people have. Yes. Um, yeah, exactly. So we take that tissue with its blood vessels and we move it up to the chest. And so we actually take out part of a rib and then find these little blood vessels that sit right on top of the lungs. And then we hook the blood vessels up so that piece of tissue can live in the, in the new space. Um, takes the microscope, we do it in a two surgeon team and people are in hospital for about five days after. So it's a really, really big surgery. Um, but it works well, especially if we're trying to sort of make a bigger droopier breast and people have that extra tissue to donate from somewhere else. Um, so those are the two main ways that, that we go about doing it. Would both of them require surgeries? You know, breast implants don't last forever. So yeah, so basically, um, when we do the belly surgery, so without the implants, I tell people, you know, what, expect probably to go for like a touch up surgery at six to 12 months after um, just to help tweak your results. But once that's all done, they tend to be kind of lifelong results. Um, so yeah, so I say it's kind of like a really big investment up front with the surgery and the recovery. But once it's your own tissue, it generally does not need maintenance versus the implants, much easier to recover from. But yeah, they're foreign bodies, so they might break, they might get hard scar tissue. So at 10, 20 years, you might be going back for further surgery just to, to change out the implants. Okay, good to know. I mean, 
these are things people need to know before they do make any of their decisions, whether it be for reconstructive or for cosmetic. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I thought I'd throw in here some <laughs> philosophical type stuff, but, um, you know, when we're deciding how to make a breast, we want to have principles to follow. And so the way that I've kind of broken down in terms of what makes a beautiful breast is you can sort of take a, a philosophical approach um, or there's a scientific approach. And so it's just going to show how complex defining beauty is. And so you'll hear these terms. We talk about beauty comes from within, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Beauty is difficult to define, but everybody knows when it walks in the room. And all these things are absolutely true. But taking the sort of artistic approach to beauty is not necessarily going to help us with surgery because you might end up, you know, potentially with a Salvador Dali looking breast as somebody might find beautiful, but not everybody. Um, so when we take a scientific approach to beauty, what are things that we um, use to guide us when doing either breast reconstruction or cosmetic breast surgery? So probably the biggest thing is symmetry. And I think we already talked about that a little bit, you know, yeah. when you're asking me about the other breasts with breast reconstruction. That being said, I threw this in here because I had a few questions come in over the weekend about this. Why are my breasts different sizes? And even though we aim for symmetry and symmetry is something we find very beautiful in nature, asymmetry is very common. And I would bet that every single woman that's listening to this this morning has asymmetrical breasts. Uh, I mean, be a zebra out there if your breasts look exactly the same because nobody's does uh, or nobody's do. Um, and when we see these asymmetric breasts, it's, it's because of physiologic causes, meaning there's nothing wrong with you. There's no tumor or anything weird that's happening. It's just the way you are. And that's why, why your breasts are asymmetrical. Um, but it is one of the principles that we use when we are doing surgery and that we try to make things symmetrical. Um, and the other thing is we look at ratios and proportions. And so um, people talk about the golden ratio, which comes again throughout art and architecture. And we can use these types of ratios to help define how big the breast is to the chest, where what the position of the breast is, and the distribution of volume, you know, on the top part of the breast compared to the lower part of the breast. Um, but again, too, trouble comes in too when you look at distribution of breast tissues. So I bring up these images because there's this really interesting study that came out um, where they interviewed plastic surgeons from all over the world. And they said, you know, tell us what you think makes the most beautiful breast. And so we see Venus de Milo there on one side and she's got a very flat upper pole. So the upper pole is that top of the breast or part of the breast on top of the nipple. And this is apparently what the French surgeons and the German surgeons really thought made a beautiful breast opposed to when they talk to Indian surgeons, Indian surgeons, and you can see there's a, a statue there of an Indian deity with a very full upper pole. Um, their concept, concept of beauty was very different. So these women tended, tended to have very full upper poles. Um, and then apparently Brazilians thought big nipples were really beautiful. And so, um, yeah, so even though we tried where to- you are, Where you go and what you want. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, so these are things we all have to keep in mind. And I guess that's where more the artistic approach comes in. So we can't rely purely on science. You know, there's a little bit of art to it, but we have to combine things. It's just, I find it interesting because, you know, we're forever trying to talk about in plastic surgery, how do we make the most beautiful breast? But it's still, it's a very elusive concept. So it changes throughout the world and it changes throughout time. So in the Victorian era, that's when they had, they call it the monobosom, monobosom. So basically these big voluptuous breasts that people would like push together and it would look like one big boob. And then in the 1920s, you had the flapper girls where it was all about being as flat as possible. And then, you know, a few, few decades later, you've got Marilyn Monroe and people are looking voluptuous again. So, I mean, when we're, we're doing permanent change to the body throughout surgery, we want to be not too influenced by trends because they will change over time. But yeah, it's, it, they're all things that we need to consider. And at the end of the day, you know, you're taking all the science side of it and kind of pushing aside, you want people to be able to look in the mirror and say that they're enough and they, they're happy with exactly who they are with what has done. I mean, that's, you get to bring that to so many people. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, so that's kind of um, part of, uh, you know, it's the interesting part and that kind of gets into, I think, why I love my job so much is, you know, there's, it's not, things aren't necessarily set in stone. There's a little bit of creative leeway with things and working with people to make them happy. Um, and then, so in terms of kind of the last little bit, I thought I'd talk a little bit 
probably kind of the more superficial stuff, but still very interesting. So we've talked all about um, breasts so far. So these are American statistics in terms of the most common plastic surgery procedures. And I think in Canada, they're probably pretty similar, but the top procedures all relate back to the breast. And so not surprisingly, breast augmentation is on top. So this is something I definitely do a lot of in my practice. Um, it's a nice surgery and people get great satisfaction from it. But interestingly, right after that, we see breast implant removal. And um, we don't- really? It is fascinating. It is, yeah. And so we don't have the statistics from 2019. My guess is probably they are gonna be a little bit delayed being released right now because of COVID. But my bet is from 2018 to 2019, we're going to see a huge jump in numbers. Um, and that's just because of a few of the news stories that have come out about implants over the past year. And so I'll talk a little bit about implant safety, because um, that was too. So that's a question that I had come in over the weekend. Are breast implants safe? Um, and, you know, and this applies to both cosmetic surgery as well as reconstructive surgery. And safety is, I think, a relative term. So we know implants are foreign bodies, it's not lifelong devices, and they have known complications associated with them. The complications, again, too, they're, they're known and they're predictable. So if you meet with your plastic surgeon and you discuss the possible risks and you're accepting of them, then yeah, then implants are for you. But I really counsel people, not lifelong devices. It's not a one-stop shop. Be prepared, you know, 10 to 20 years, you might need further surgery. Um, in terms of implants coming out, so I've definitely had some women come to the office and say, this is just not me anymore. You know, we talked about women gain weight over time and with aging. And so a lot of women that maybe had implants put in their 20s, you know, were flat then. And then with life and subsequent pregnancy, their breasts have grown and they don't need the implants anymore. So they choose to have them taken out. Um, but one of the things that's really come to the forefront in the last year is the lymphoma associated with breast implants. Um, and so basically, um, this is related to a very specific type of implant. Um, and so this implant has what we call a textured surface because it's got a fixed shape. And this textured surface causes the implant to adhere on the inside, um, so it prevents it from flipping around. And um, it's something about this textured surface that apparently can set off this cancer. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, where did you last hear me? Right here. The, so it's a, I was just asking, is this a specific type of implant though? This isn't a generic, you know, you don't know where it is. You guys know, exactly. you know, it's, it's well yeah. done. Let's see if I stop sharing. Can I show you my props? There. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so it's a very specific type of implant that causes this lymphoma. Um, so it's not for everybody that has a breast implant to freak out about right now. Um, so yeah, so basically, this is a type of implant um, that was causing all the grief. And so um, if you look compared to we call this a smooth round implant, this just has a round shape. This has a teardrop shape. And because of this teardrop shape, it needs this textured surface to Velcro in. Um, because it shift. sorry, it doesn't shift exactly. Yeah, because if it flips, then your breast's going to look upside down, which um, most people probably don't want. No. Um, so we found throughout the years that there is it's a very rare lymphoma, but it is real. And so I think the studies show maybe um, the highest is one in 30, sorry, one in 3000 women could develop this. And because of that, they did pull them off the market last year. Um, but what they did not do is recommend for women with these implants to have them removed because there's risks of going ahead with surgery to take them out or replace them. Um, but that being said, I've definitely seen many women. I never used them in my practice um, just because I didn't like them for a variety of other reasons. But I have had women come in and say, you know, one in 3000 um, is too high for me. And so that's, you know, even kind of going back to the mammograms, right? It's you have to consider what risk you're, you're willing to accept. And so women are saying, you know, one in 3000 is too high. I don't want to worry about developing cancer from my implant, I want them out. And so um, definitely, we've been taking them out, some women are choosing to just leave them out, other women are choosing to have smooth implants put back in. Um, so, so Outside of the reconstructive surgery, which is an incredible thing that's offered here in Alberta, 
if people are listening to this, they're wondering, you know, okay, well, what should I be planning on cost wise if I want to just do this for myself? Is there a ballpark in that or a starting point in that? And realistically, you're not walking in there. It's not a $200 procedure and you have to save for what, what's coming 10 years down the road, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So ballpark, it's probably most surgeons will start around $8,000. Um, if you need a lift at the same time as your implants, then it's going to be potentially somewhere around 13. Um, so it really depends on the complexity of the procedure. And in terms of uh, complications, so if you have an immediate complication, normally you're not paying for that if you have to go back to the operating room because you've got a bleed or something like that. Um, some of the complications like implant rupture or capsular contracture, which is hardening of scar tissue on the implant, there is a warranty from the implant companies that will cover parts of the cost of surgery. But implants don't stop your breasts from aging. So if 10 years from now you've got implants and the breasts have become droopy or they don't quite fit the size of your body and you need a revision for cosmetic reasons, absolutely that's going to come out of your own pocket. So I think it's good to be prepared for that if you are going to be committing to surgery because it is, it's a big investment for people in terms of both time and the recovery needed with surgery. Absolutely. Thank you so much for covering all these points. So you can talk, you can tell your passion as you come through there. And I, I want to end on a, you know, a positive note too, that doors are slowly starting to be opened, especially for the reconstructive side, but you know, just to reiterate that this is being done slowly and safely, just anybody watching. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we haven't given the go ahead. I think we just want to see what happens with elective day surgeries right now. I mean, cause ultimately you know, we want to do no harm to anybody. So if we start opening up surgery again, then we want to make sure to keep things safe. I absolutely agree. Thank you so much for the time. And I know you have surgery coming up this week already. So, you know, we'll let you get, get ready for that. And it's been a pleasure chatting with you. I could ask you a thousand more questions because I think it's just fascinating the knowledge that you have. So really, really appreciate it. And we'll make sure that this is available to you to share as well. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. It, you, you know, there's so many things to cover. We probably didn't get through everything, but I hope at least that gives people some of a glimpse in terms of, you know, what's involved with breast health and breast surgery. So yeah, stay safe, stay healthy, everybody. I absolutely agree. Thank you so, so much. Go enjoy the rest of your day. You might need an umbrella, but get outside too. Yeah, absolutely. You too. Okay. Bye. All right. We'll talk to you later.